All right, so welcome to this workshop on LGBTQ plus research tools available through McCain Library. My name is Casey Wong and with me today is Rebecca Holtzclaw and we're going to be talking to you about some of the resources that we have in our collection. So first off, we have several archival databases that Rebecca will be uh, introducing to you. And then for those of you who are not familiar with the databases that we have for current news and journals uh, focused on LGBTQ interests, then we're going to be showing you the best tools for that as well. And then finally, Rebecca is going to show you the queer cinema guide that she created to make finding movies in a library easier. But before we get started with all that, I do want to have a start at the library homepage. So agnescott.edu forward slash library is where you start all of your research. And if you're looking for things that are going to be related to LGBTQ research, then probably your best bet to start with is to come down here to the bottom of the screen where the discover search box is and go to databases A to Z. This is going to give you a full list of all the databases that we have access to. We have 284 databases. And many of these will touch upon LGBTQ issues. Um, there's lots of newspapers, historical newspapers that we have that you might want to explore um, that are based off of certain regions. So that might be a useful tool to you. But the easiest way to find all the databases that relate predominantly to uh, gender and sexuality studies is to go to the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies subject list. And there you're going to see several of the databases we're going to be talking about today. Rebecca's going to be talking about archive of sexuality and gender. Um, I'll be talking about Gender Watch and LGBTQ source. So this is really the place that you might be able to get started with your research. So I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca. I'm going to stop sharing and let Rebecca take over and tell you about the archival sources. So I'm going to go ahead and share um my screen and you should be able to see that. So I'm going to talk about the archival sources. Um, archival sources, we do have quite a, um, access to quite a few of them in our collection and today I'm just going to go over two of them that uh, relate to LGBTQ uh, research. So um, archival sources are a great place to begin a project just because it helps you identify what information is out there. Um, you can kind of get a post historic perspective. Um, and just a general understanding that might help you to expand your uh, topic or your research if you're not really sure what you want to look into yet. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is Archives of Sexuality and Gender. Um, so the Archives of Sexuality and Gender is a very unique uh, archive because it has information dating back to the 16th century, which you are not going to find in the LGBT thought and culture archive, which focuses primarily on the 20th century. So in this uh, archives of sexuality and gender, you're going to be able to examine how sexual norms have changed over time. And you can also look into um, topics such as health and hygiene, the development of sex education uh, in the pre 20th century. You can look at um, the founding of social movements, organizations, activism, changing gender roles, um, as well as more specific topics, topics as well, such as erotica and the foundation of that. Um, and it's not that they, that the Archives of Sexuality and Gender does not have 20th century documentation, because it does. It has over one and a half million pages that just cover information from 1940 to 2014. Um, but you might be able to find a more unique historic perspective in the Archives of Sexuality and Gender. And that perspective can provide context to information that you're finding in the databases that Casey is going to talk about, as well as in the LGBT thought and culture archive. So I'm going to talk about uh, two collections that are very unique to the archives of sexuality and gender. Um, one of them is going to be the private case from the British Library and this is going to be uh, comprised of printed books that were separated from the main library uh, from the 1850s to 1990s on grounds of obscenity. So you're getting uh, information from the 1850s and you're able to see what was uh, classified as being obscene information um, and just how the social mores have changed in that time. Now another uh, collection that is within the archives of sexuality and gender is the special subject units from sex research. So this is actually from the Kinsey Institute um, for sex research and it's a collection dating from 1700 to 1860. So you're getting very old information and how uh, sex was viewed and sexuality was viewed in the 
uh, hundreds. And so this is a portion of Dr. Kinsey's original library, which he used to study human sexual behavior from a variety of academic and literary viewpoints. So this is something that you're not really going to find in the LGBT thought and culture, and you might not find in other databases. Um, and it's unique to this archive. So that might be beneficial if those are, uh, if that is a topic that you're interested to look into or that you want to explore. So I'm going to show you the uh, archives of sexuality and gender uh, web page so you can see how it looks and how you can navigate it. So from the home screen, um, you're really just getting a brief uh, summary of what is available in this archive, but you can explore the individual collections and that's going to be very useful because this is, this is an archive that focuses primarily on activism. Um, and it, they just have large collections that are uh, based on exploring activism in the um, 20th century. So here you can see that you have ACT UP, uh, the AIDS Coalition, you have Gay Activism in Britain, as well as a lot of other collections. You have the Lesbian Her Story archives, which is also very unique uh, in that it's the largest lesbian um, focused archive in the world. Um, you have the Canadian Lesbian and Gay archives in this, which covers global organizations and events as well as national. So you're getting uh, perspectives from all over the world in this archive that are very useful. I'm going to talk about the content type briefly, um, because when you're doing research on this archive, you're going to either get information that is in a manuscript, a monograph, a newspaper, a periodical, and a photograph. Which, when I started researching on this, I said I have no idea how to find anything. Everything is showing up as a manuscript or a monograph. And I'm not really sure what I'm looking for. And then I figured out how to navigate it by the document type. So now I can narrow it down to an advertisement or um, a performance program or a recipe, which just sounds amazing. And it narrows down uh, documents that have recipes in them, um, which might not be what your research includes, but that's, that's always fun. So um, back to the uh, slide, compared to the LGBT thought and culture, um, the content is going to be slightly different. As I said, LGBT thought and culture will focus on the 20th century. It's also going to focus on books and periodicals and archival materials that document uh, LGBT political, social, and cultural movements throughout the 20th century. Um, you might find oral histories and diaries uh, and personal documents that create this intimate uh, personal perspective to your research. So you can browse with your, um, you can browse titles and series periodicals, authors and organizations, or you can browse the archival collections. So let's look at what that's going to look like. This is your home screen for LGBT thought and culture. Um, and you can see it gives you all different kinds of subjects and uh, ways to browse your search, but we're going to look at the archival collections. So when you look at an archival collection, it will tell you how many documents are going to be available in that archive. Uh, it's going to tell you who the people are typically um, or what organization or collection this comes from. So I'm going to look at the Bob Dameron papers because I find these to be very fascinating. Now, I don't know who Bob Dameron is. I've never heard of the man before. But just in looking at this collection, I found out that he had a lot of address books. So I said, OK, well, what are these address books? And when I went to open one, I started to realize that these were um, similar to what uh, the Green Book was for the African-American community. The address book, the Bob Dameron address book in particular, was uh, it's typically viewed as the original guidebook for LGBTQ communities in the um, 60s and 70s. So when people were traveling, they could look, um, they could get one of these guidebooks, they could look through them to see what are some communities that are welcoming, or what are some um, states or locations that are welcoming to the LGBT community. And what I'm able to view just by looking in this Bob Dameron collection is how um, I can view the page, uh, the page count that this was 50, this is the first issue, 1965, and it had 52 pages. And then I can look at a more recent issue and notice that um, in 1979, it had 340 pages. So as you can see that there's this cultural change going on in America, um, and he is finding more and more locales that are welcoming to the LGBT community. And so you can look at a source just like this, which is just a guidebook, um, 
and you can find all of this uh, other historic information that really expands your research. Um, one thing I do like about the um, LGBT thought and culture database is the way that you can narrow the content type. So on the side, you're going to see that you have your content type listed here. And when you open it, it'll have all the small options, just like you saw on the archives of sexuality and gender. However, sometimes they'll be phrased differently. So on the archives of sexuality and gender, I found um, a performance program. Whereas under the LGBT thought and culture, you're going to find um, a playbill. And so even though it means the, it's essentially the exact same thing, it's just going to be uh, worded different. So that's something you want to keep in mind when looking at your archives is that you are going to have um, some terms that maybe weren't used at the time, um, or you might have content types that are slightly different, but that shouldn't deter you in your research. So there are two search tools that are very beneficial in the archives of sexuality and gender, and that is the term frequency and the topic finder. I'm going to go back to the home page for the archives of sexuality and gender and walk through those real quick. So top, uh, topic finder is very beneficial if you maybe don't know a lot about your topic yet or you don't really have a topic, you just have a general idea. Um, what I was looking into when I was doing my research for this workshop is uh, drag balls. I wanted, wanted to learn more about them. I was very interested in what information I could find. And so the, what, what I did was I went to the topic finder and I just searched a general search of the phrase um, and it comes up with related terms uh, that have more detailed information underneath them. And so some of these I, I was already looking at and I went, okay, well, I already kind of know how a lot of these relate. But then I came across one that I said, Susie's drag scene, what on earth is that? Um, and so when I opened it and I looked into it, it turns out it was a segment in a um, gay periodical back in the early 70s and it would just spotlight a character or a, um, um, a drag queen or a drag persona uh, who was popular at the time or maybe not popular but it was kind of their 15 minutes of fame um, and it would just tell information about their personal life there'd be a photo you'd get kind you just get, would get to see this uh, historic perspective of who this person was and what their daily life was like and so that's something that um, you might not be able to find in the LGBT uh, thought and culture because it's very specific to this archive so you are going to have some resources that overlap but you're also going to have ones that are very unique to these individual archives and that are just very useful in expanding um, your knowledge on this topic. So if anyone wants to write a paper on uh, Susie's drag scene, I definitely recommend using this archive. Um, and then as far as comparisons go, and it's a personal preference, I do think that the LGBT thought and culture tends to be more organized. And that might just be how I am um, used to researching databases and archives. However, I do think the archives of sexuality and gender is just very fun to play around in and has such just all this very unique information that you're not gonna find elsewhere. Um, and that really can go for both of these that you're not gonna find this information elsewhere. So that's the benefits of uh, using archives. And Casey, I'm going to pass it to you to talk about your databases. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Let me share my screen again. So I'm going to talk to you about current news and journal databases. So what Rebecca was just telling you about is great that um, you can, through archives, you're able to find really unique stories that are out there. And sometimes historians recommend that you start with just exploring archives and seeing what kind of objects you can find. Just like Rebecca did, she found some really interesting things about travel guides, she found re recipes, and the way that those materials are displayed and the context. So once you have your materials, something that really interests you, then you can start exploring more about um, how scholars have interpreted that. And so that's when you're going to want to go to the current news and journal databases. Uh, before we go into the two that I'm going to tell you about, I wanted to go back to the library homepage and just mention that you can always start this kind of search in Discover. So we could do ACT UP in this first box and just run the search. 
And then once we get inside this database, you can go to advanced search and you can narrow down to uh, a discipline that will better represent what you're looking for. So if I go to advanced search here and I scroll down, you can see that there's multiple disciplines and there isn't one that's specific about LGBTQ, but you can see that women's studies is most likely going to be the department that would focus in on that topic. Same with sociology. And you may also want to look at psychology and politics and government. So you can narrow things down here because it's not giving you something that's very specific to LGBTQ. Then you might want to throw in some keywords here. Um, ACT UP is a organization that fought against, um, fought to raise awareness about AIDS and to get people to move on, on to making some changes. Um, so most likely, most of the things with that will be much more broad. But if you want to add in additional terms to narrow it so that uh, it's bringing up one of these keywords um, that would make it more LGBTQ focused, then you can see that just starting to type in a keyword will give you a collection of options. And I can just click on this middle one to get a wide array. And it's gonna search for any of these keyword terms um, in combination with ACT UP. So it's giving, the OR in here is giving it options. I'm gonna go ahead and run this search and you'll see that um, the kind of materials that come up in this search that in every single database that we have that's a journal database, you can narrow your search over here on the left by date and by type of material. So this is where we can get to our academic journals. This database is not gonna be helpful at all in terms of getting to the archival sources. That's why it's so great that Rebecca took the time to show you those. But this is a way that you can narrow down to more of the academic journals to get the context of whatever it is that you found in the archival sources. Um, so that's um, our broad database, but we have two databases that we often recommend for LGBTQ research. So if you go to databases A to Z and um, go to, you can use the alphabetical menu because I'm going to be telling you what the names of those are, or we can go to women, gender, and sexuality studies. So the two that I was going to talk about are LGBTQ source and gender watch. So let me go back to the slides so that you can see kind of the difference of these. So first off, Gender Watch is a database that, both of these are small. Um, Gender Watch has only 373 publications. It's a mixture of books, journals, magazines, news sources. Uh, same with LGBTQ plus source. It has 661 publications overall. So very small databases, very small collections. That doesn't mean that that's all the content. In those 661, you're going to have thousands and thousands of articles that are uh, published in journals, magazines, and newspapers. So there's still a lot of content, but the source that you're getting from is very focused in on these topics. So with Gender Watch, that one um, is something that's been plugged more as the history of the women's movement um, or the evolution of the women's movement. It does have a lot with that of uh, feminism and um, kind of thinking about the idea of feminism and women's work roles, um, gender roles, things like that. But um, it does have a Bit of information that it's helpful for people who are doing LGBTQ plus studies. Um, there's definitely magazines and journals that are significantly focused on those topics. But really your best source is going to be going to LGBTQ plus source if what you really want is to examine critical perspectives of LGBTQ uh, research and interests. There they have the 50 most important historically significant LGBTQ plus journals, magazines, and regional newspapers. And even though it has 661 publications, some of those are just citations that you might be able to get through interlibrary loan. So you find out that an article existed and then we'll, we'll request it for you through interlibrary loan. But they do have over 140 full text journals and 160 full text books. So a way to look at this um, as well is to see that in terms of magazines for Gender Watch, um, Gender Watch just has about 18 magazines on LGBTQ interests, but you can see that it does have significant titles. So you might want to be 
looking at the advocate, which is also in um, LGBTQ source, anything that's not in bold here is also in LGBTQ source. So these are some of the core sources that somebody who's trying to keep up with LGBTQ um, issues might want to look at. And I love that Rebecca was talking about the travel guides because here we have a magazine called The Out Traveler. So that would be a great compliment to examining the guides that she was looking at. And then in terms of journals, there are 16 journals that are focused and I don't have the list of them listed here, but you can see that Gender Watch will have something for you. It is a place to go, but most likely LGBTQ plus is gonna be the better source. So that's what I'm gonna focus in on for our search real quick in terms of the demo. So going back to the library homepage, I'm gonna to go to databases A to Z. And because we know the name of the database we're looking for, I'm just gonna click on L for LGBTQ plus and go straight to it. So it's gonna prompt you for your username and password if um, you're doing this on campus or off campus and you haven't logged into a database before. Um, and here I can just go ahead and start searching for ACT UP. We'll do the same kind of search that we did before. And there's not really much of a need for me to narrow it in terms of the terms LGBTQ or gay or lesbian, mainly because this whole source, this whole database is focused on literature that is predominantly in those areas. It does have some broader political and social magazines that help provide context for the time period um, that you might be looking at, but overall it's going to be predominantly LGBTQ uh, plus resources. And so here you can see we've got 767 articles. We can narrow it down over here and it's a much more manageable number. Um, there's only 40 articles over here and we can see kind of what the scholarly topics are in here. So this can help us, um, we can probably narrow our search if we go to advanced search and be more specific about what we're looking for using these other boxes. Um, but that's going to give you a substantial amount of scholarly sources. The other thing since Rebecca was talking about the travel guides, I wanted to go ahead and show you that um, when you're searching in this database, it doesn't search within the full text of the article. So I'm trying to remember, it was the, um, how do you spell it again, Rebecca, the drum? So, it, yeah, it was Bob uh, Damron, D-A-M-R-O-N, and it was called the address book. Yeah, so I'm gonna do Damron and then address book up here. So if you find something in those, um, archives and you want to learn more about them in context, you can start here. Oh, right it was, now. Oh, it's D-A-M-R-O-N. D-A-M-R. Yes. O-N. Thank you. So I'm going to run this search. And I'm not getting a whole lot, but it is mentioning um, the subject. So some of these are more reviews of the book, so you can learn more about perspectives of how they were helpful. Um, so if we click on this, it's gonna delve us straight into that review and we can learn more about um, how it was uh, thought of as being a helpful source. So here it is, new edition, um, list bars, restaurants, publications, and includes many of the um, places outside of the, the continental United States. So it, that's really helpful and it's indicating that it's predominantly for men. So that's useful information to know. I wish that there were more um, resources in here and I wish that they were more scholarly. So one thing I can do is I can change this so that it's looking for Dameron and address book and all text. And then I'm gonna change this search to be more about travel. And so this is gonna search in the full text text for address book and Dameron. Um, so I'm hoping that they're going to mention the Dameron guide in a search about travel. So there is eight sources that I found that were significantly mentioning Dameron guide. Um, and because I added the word travel, that's why it didn't really expand. But you can see that I'm getting definitely a different collection of sources um, that can give more context. And some of them are academic. So um, that's how you can utilize this database in complementing the um, archives um, 
collections that Rebecca showed you. So there's a couple of other things that you can do in here. They have a great thesaurus for helping you with your keywords. Um, but what I would like to recommend is if you go to publications, how you can identify um, current issues of a publication. So I'm going to look for the app kit. And you can see that if this is a current publication, it's to the present. If I click on the advocate, and this is a publication I want to keep up with, um, you can see that um, I can get to the most current issues here. So this will give me the ones that were published the last month. So I can just browse the table of contents for the last month if I want to do that. So I can bookmark this page. I usually bookmark it by clicking on share and then copying this link and just bookmarking it someplace. But you could also set up an email alert. So you could just set up an alert so that it will send you the table of contents every month. Um, so that's a way you can keep up with publications that interest you, whether it be a journal or magazine. So that's what I was going to tell you about those particular publications. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, Rebecca, did you want to tell them about the queer um, cinema guide? Sure. So um, I created a queer cinema uh, research guide last spring um, because I noticed that we had a lot of DVDs in our uh, collection in McCain Library that feature um, queer protagonists or that tell queer stories. So I uh, essentially just wanted to compile a list of all the films we owned and then that kind of expanded into looking at the um, books and ebooks in our collection that are about the history of um, LGBTQ uh, people in cinema and in early Hollywood. Um, so it's it's primarily go uh, geared towards people who are maybe researching film history um, or that just want to see how representation has changed over time, whether it's been great representation or terrible. Um, but I'll, I'll just navigate real quick how the guide works. So I do have the books and ebooks separated um, and popular subjects that you can find more resources under. Um, and then I have the uh, American films separated from international films just because we do have a large collection of both. And under the international queer cinema, I do have journals that are specific for um, international films as well as uh, a book list. And then under online resources, you're going to find the LGBT thought and culture archive that I talked about earlier. And you're also going to find um, Gender Watch. And then I'll be adding the ar archives of sexuality and gender and um, LGBTQ source that uh, Casey talked about earlier to this database list. So that will be expanding. And then I also added some websites that I thought for use were useful um, just for looking at LGBTQ film and some of them are reviews that have been, you know, have been compiled on this website since the 80s and 90s. Well, not the 80s, but the 90s. Um, and so they are good uses or good sources for information on LGBT uh, represent, representation in film. So that's it for the, uh, for the research guide. <laughs> Great. Well, um, thanks for all the work that you put into telling us about the archival sources. Before we wrap up, I wanted to ask you a question, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. um, you were fairly new to looking at the archival databases, and I feel like all students um, and people who are new to those databases get a little frustrated and confused at first. What, what helped you get over feeling any kind of um, confusion about the structure? What would you recommend to people in terms of getting comfortable with those databases because you grew to love them. Yeah, I think it's just about kind of comparing the two. That's what made me look really like learn how to navigate the site because at first I wasn't sure how to navigate either of them. And then I started saying, okay, well, this has content types. This has content types. Oh, this one has document types. Why is that different from content types? Why can't there just be a universal language among the archives? Um, so it was just navigating the sites and, and learning how to use them. Um, Obviously, I think I, I kind of said earlier that I really like the archives of sexuality and gender a lot because I wanted to find the older information, the pre 20th century information. Um, but I really did like the collections that the LGBT thought and culture um, had laid out. I got really excited about the address book and finding that. So it's really just playing around with the site and um, using terms. There was a second search tool that I meant to mention earlier, but I forgot about it because I don't like it. 
And that's a term frequency. And so that's where you can look at maybe um, documents, the origin of a term in a document. And I can just show that real quick. Sure. Since we're on the subject, um, that's going to be on the archives of gender and sexuality. And so if you go to the home screen and at the bottom, it's going to have a term frequency. So the term that I looked up, I looked up a few of them, but um, one of them was asexual. And so when I searched that term, you're going to find information that is dated back to 1952. But if you look at that document, it's in a manuscript that spans a length of time from 1950 something to 2000 and something. So the actual word that, or usage of the word that I found was more recent, but it was dated mm -hmm. back to then because that is what the manuscript spanned. So I didn't find that to be very useful, but it is good for just looking at the, how the popularity has grown over time. Mm -hmm. So you can see that in 1975, there were 42 documents that mentioned that. And so you're seeing that it's starting to become more popularized um, as time goes, goes on. I think that's actually really, so that thing, I think it's great that you pointed out that it can be misleading, um, but you notice how you can add a row in there. Um, what this is really useful for is that comparing the change in terms of how a term that may have been used previously goes out of fashion um, and becomes much more derogatory or um, just not representative uh, and compare it to a newer term because um, this is something that Google does with their Ingram mm -hmm. and it is really kind of fascinating to compare the two but yeah it seems like they haven't really refined it well enough to be able to make it so that it's truly representing the content from those time periods. But and that's that might really awesome. be, again, because of, that might be because I'm a new user to the archive. Maybe there's some secret trick that I haven't learned yet. No, but, this um, is just a <laughs> different way of doing research that helps people understand more how language changes. So I think that's really, I love that you showed that. Um, I think the only other thing that um, I wanted to mention, unless there's anything else you have, is just how they can reach us. Do you have anything else? Um, no, that was everything. Okay, cool. I'm going to share real quick and just point out exactly how you can reach Rebecca and I. Rebecca is here most evenings, so depending on what our hours are, you're going to find her usually on Sundays um, through Thursdays. Um, until the library services close. So, and I'll usually be here more in the morning. And Liz Bagley is our core person for LGBTQ and uh, women and gender sexuality studies. So you can always set up an appointment with um, Liz or myself to do one-on-one -on -one appointments. So there's Liz and down here is me. And if you want to um, reach either Rebecca or I, you can always email us at library at agnescott.edu, or if you see this chat window open, most likely she or I might be hanging out behind there, ready to answer your question, especially in the evenings, you'll probably find Rebecca. But thank you for watching our video on this, and we hope that if you have any questions, you'll set up times to meet with us one-on-one, -on -one and we can talk with you about how we can find the information that you need. Thanks so much. Bye.